we're kind of coming to the end of a, a section, really. The last bit of Romans 11. And as I kind of alluded to a little bit last week, not only is it the end of Romans 11, the end of Romans 9, 10 and 11, but it's really the end of where we've got up to at Romans so far, we're going right back to chapter 1. As we come into chapter 12, we are looking more at the application side of things. In view of all this um, astounding doctrine that we've seen in the first 11 chapters, it's almost like Paul, by the Holy Spirit, says, right, now it's your turn. You've got to do something about it. So we're not quite there yet. And like I said, I think we may have a, a, a week or two of a, of a break in Romans. Um, but yeah, it's, it's quite an amazing thing when you reach this section. And um, it's almost like something in, in, in Paul's spirit, the Holy Spirit communicates something of that to him when you look at the last four verses. So without any further ado, just briefly without going back all the way to beginning, Romans 11. We saw right from the beginning in that first verse in Romans 11, again, the question being raised, has God finished with his people Israel? And again, it's a resounding no. Paul explains, if he had finished, I wouldn't be saved. Such a one as me would not be saved. And we see that that's been a principle Going way, way back through the Bible, God has always had a remnant, an elect remnant, an election within an election, if you like. And we moved on to look at the olive tree and saw how we as Gentiles have been grafted into this place of blessing that has come from the covenant that God made with Abraham, focusing on the part where God said, in you. I will bless all the families of the world. That's every Gentile, every Jew. Branches were broken off, branches were grafted in. And like when you come to the end of that section, Paul says, look, if God is able to graft in the wild olive branches, which is contrary to nature, surely it's so much more of a simple thing for the natural branches to be grafted back in. And this is where we come to verse 25, and I'll start there and read to the end of the chapter. It's Romans 11, verse 25. For I do not want you, brethren, to be uninformed or ignorant of this mystery, lest you be wise in your own estimation, that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And thus all Israel will be saved. Just as it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will remove ungodliness from Jacob. And this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. From the standpoint of the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But from the standpoint of God's choice, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. For the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. For just as you once were disobedient to God but now have been shown mercy because of their disobedience so these also now have been disobedient in order that because of mercy shown to you they also may now be shown mercy for God has shut up all in disobedience that he might show mercy to all oh the depths of the riches of both the wisdom and knowledge of God how unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable are his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who became his counsellor? Or who has first given him that he might be paid back to him again? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Amazing. Well, verse 25, Paul starts off 
by mentioning a couple of words that I want to look at. He says, For I do not want you, brethren. Again, it's a reminder he's writing to those who he considers brethren, to believers. I don't want you to be uninformed of this mystery, lest you be wise in your own estimation that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. Some translations you will read, I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren. There's a good joke about that, by the way. Arnold Fuchtenbaum. I don't know if you might, you might have heard it, but it's a good joke. And he starts off listing all the different Baptist denominations that there are. Almost seems like there's hundreds of them. And he says there, there's almost as many brethren denominations. You've got the open brethren, closed brethren, exclu you know, exclusive brethren and he said it's perfectly fine to be a member of any one of these brethren groups but there's only one group of brethren that the bible commands you never to join and that's where it says i wouldn't have you ignorant brethren <laughs> and that's what we've got here and that word for ignorant or uninformed in the greek is agnoeo agnoeo it's where we get our english word agnostic and it means not to know. Just, it means not to know something. To not have knowledge. And Paul says that it's not God's will for us not to have knowledge on this subject. And it's so sad to see such a prevailing lack of knowledge in the church on this subject. And maybe we can even take it a step further and say maybe the error on this particular subject isn't down to a lack of knowledge it's down to a refusal to take God at his word and like we've seen in these last three chapters to take on this serious serious error of replacement theology where people read into the Bible that God has replaced Israel with the church but Paul says we are not to be ignorant about this Now, the next word that I want to have a look at is this word mystery. Because we are not to be uninformed or ignorant of this mystery. And what is this mystery? That a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And then all Israel will be saved. Now this word mystery, we, we may have touched on it in the past, mysterion in the Greek, it's not the same sense as what we often think of the word mystery in our modern day English. We often think of a mystery as something that cannot be known, like a murder mystery that takes a great deal of investigation to try and solve and may never even be solved. All kinds of programs on the telly, the mysteries of this, the mysteries of that, and you get to the end of the program and you're none the wiser. It's a mystery. And you think, well, that was a waste of half an hour, wasn't it? But a mystery in the Bible is defined for us in a couple of places. And if we turn to Ephesians chapter 3. It's an amazing passage in Ephesians chapter 3. And I'll just read from verse 1. It says, For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles... If indeed you have heard of the stewardship or the administration or the dispensation of God's grace which was given to me for you, that by revelation there was made known to me the mystery as I wrote before in brief. And by referring to this when you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ. And then he gives the definition of what a mystery is, which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. And in this instance, the mystery regarding Christ is the fact that the Gentiles are now fellow heirs and fellow members of the body, one with the Jewish believers, one new man. That's the mystery that's being referred to here. But you see how Paul defines this word mystery. That it's something that wasn't known up until the time it is revealed. And it's not revealed by intellect 
or study or research or anything. It's something that is divinely revealed. It says revealed to the apostles and prophets by the Spirit. It's God's revelation at a certain point in time. Something that wasn't revealed in the Old Testament primarily, but is now. And so this, when we come back to Romans 11 and verse 25, this partial hardening of Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles come in, and then all Israel being saved, was something that wasn't known up until this time when it's revealed here. There are things connected with it that were revealed in the Old Testament, which we will look at. Paul says later on in that verse, it's a, it's a packed verse, this, it really is. If we don't understand this, what's going to happen? We're going to be wise in our own estimation. We will be, there's not many things worse than that. Somebody who thinks they're right when they're flat wrong. And we, it can happen to all of us. But if we don't understand this, if we don't get this right, then we, and again, thinking of the state of the church when it comes to things like this, wise in our own estimation, what a tragedy for us as a church. Walking around proclaiming something as truth, when actually it's the complete opposite of what God has said. When you carry on reading a bit further on in Romans, going into chapter 12, it says in verse 16, be of the same mind towards one another. Do not be haughty in mind or high-minded, but associate with the lonely. Do not be wise in your own estimation. It's not a characteristic that sits well in the body of Christ. And so it's a, it's a really important thing that we really need to get to grips with and get right. Again, it's something that it almost seems like you can just put it on the shelf, you know. At best, I've heard it with people that do teach, because we, we, we've been in churches for years that just flat out teach. Every time you read Israel in the Old Testament, you can just replace it with church. When I was a kid, the church we went to when I was a kid, they used to sing the song from Isaiah, Awake, awake, O Zion. Clothe yourself with strength. Put on garments of splendor, O Jerusalem. They believed it was on about them. They were singing about the church. It was a rousing song to get the church up and yeah, We're the church. This is us. You go on and read the next line. And it says something about the, the uncircumcised will no longer come to you. <laughs> and no uncircumcised people are going to come to the church. What? Shows you how mad it can get. We're not to be ignorant about it. Now, this partial hardening... We've already seen quite a bit about this earlier in the chapter and in, in, in the last two chapters as well. That this hardening came about through Israel's rejection of the Messiah, through their idolatry, through their preventing the gospel going to the, or their attempt to prevent the gospel going to the Gentiles, I should say. And the fact that they didn't really believe Moses to begin with is what hardened their hearts so that when the Messiah came, they rejected him. But it's partial. And like we saw earlier in the chapter, it's partial. It's meaning that it is not a total hardening because otherwise there wouldn't be a believing remnant. There wouldn't be that believe, believing elect. So it wasn't total. Paul using himself as the example, and remember he spoke about the 7,000 back in Elijah's day, so it's the same now. And it is not a final hardening because there is an end point to it because it is only a hardening until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. And that quite simply means that only God knows the number, but as I understand it, there will come a time when the last Gentile, before the rapture of the church, the last Gentile will believe, will come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and that will complete the Gentile believers in the body of Christ. And when that happens, at some point, whether it's instant or shortly after, I believe that's when the rapture of the church will take place. Nobody knows, you know. Could happen at absolutely any time. It's an amazing thing to think, but this is how God has planned things. 
And when we come on to verse 26, we've got this amazing line that says, And thus, and then, all Israel will be saved. All Israel will be saved. Now again, I've heard that interpreted in a number of different ways. There are some that think, and it's, you know, not just Jews, but I've heard Christians think that that, that, that means all Jews. Everybody that is a physical descendant from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But we have seen that it is only the remnant that will be saved. Going back to Romans 9, verse 27. He quotes from Isaiah, showing that this was in Isaiah. At the end of verse 27, it is the remnant that will be saved. So it's, we know it's not speaking of all Abraham's lineage. Jesus spoke to Nicodemus, you've got to be born again to enter the kingdom. John the Baptist, remember he, he rebuked the Pharisees coming to him for baptism, saying, just because you think you're sons of Abraham. So it's not that. I had a pastor try and explain to me one time that he, he, he doesn't really believe in replacement theology because there are still individual Jews that are getting saved. Like Paul used himself as an example. And it would be, verse, it would be looking at this verse and saying that it doesn't mean all Israel, it just means that individual Jews can still be saved. But that is completely changing what it plainly and simply says here. It says, all Israel. This phrase was used back in Romans 9, 6. Again, referring to a believing remnant. In Romans 9, 6, Paul said, But it is not as though the word of God has failed, for they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel. And if you remember back when we were looking at that, Again, it wasn't teaching that this is the church. It was just saying that there is a spiritual Israel. There are believers within the elect nation of Israel who are truly Israel, the Israel of God, if you like, who have come to faith. And it's the same term, all Israel. Now, I just want to take a bit of time just to read through some scriptures because what we've got in God's word is Israel's entire history from the beginning right through to the end, right through on into the millennial kingdom. And it's just reading through some verses that show us this and explain this. Um, just following on verse 26, where it says, And thus all Israel shall be saved, just as it is written, and then quoting from Isaiah 59, the del deliverer will come from Zion, speaking of Christ. He will remove ungodliness from Jacob, and this is my covenant with them, when I take away their sins. Israel's whole history is laid out in Deuteronomy in a number of ways and a number of times. If we go back to chapter 4, now I just want to read a few verses from Deuteronomy chapter 4. So we'll go from verse 25 to 32. And just think about this, right? This was written round about 1400 BC. 1400 BC, right at the beginning of Israel's history. And even for the, 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 the liberal-minded theologians or skeptics that don't even believe the Bible that won't accept that this was written in 400, 1400 BC. The Dead Sea Scrolls that were discovered in 1947 I don't think there's really much argument, even in the secular world, that they weren't written round about 150, 200 BC. So even they have to accept that this is written a couple hundred years before Christ and the mass dispersion of the Jews in 70 AD. So you bear that in mind as you read through passages like this. It says, when you became the father... Of children, sorry, when you become, I beg your pardon, when you become the father of children and children's children and have remained long in the land and act corruptly and make an idol in the form of anything and do that which is evil in the sight of the Lord your God so as to provoke him to anger, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that you shall surely perish quickly from the land where you are going over the Jordan to possess it. 
You shall not live long on it, but you shall utterly be destroyed. And the Lord will scatter you among the peoples, and you shall be left few in number among the nations where the Lord shall drive you. And there you will serve God's, the work of man's hands, wood, stone, which neither see nor hear nor eat nor smell. But from there you will seek the Lord your God, and you will find him if you search for him with all your heart and all your soul. When you are in distress, and all these things have come upon you, in the latter days you will return to the Lord your God and listen to his voice. For the Lord your God is a compassionate God, he will not fail nor destroy you nor forget the covenant with your fathers which he swore to them. Indeed, ask now concerning the former days which were before you, since the day that God created man on earth and inquire from one end of the heavens to the other, has anything been done like this great thing or has anything been heard like it? Wow. You've got Israel's rejection of God. You've got their expulsion to all the nations and in the latter days, their restoration and their regathering. And he says there at the end of verse 32, nothing like this has happened in all of human history, nor ever will. This is why God says that Israel are my witnesses. They're witnesses to testify that I am an omniscient God of prophecy that not only knows everything and can perform the seemingly impossible and I will glorify myself in this nation. It's all there in that brief passage. Now, if we go a little bit further into this, in this history, how, how does this play out? How are all Israel going to be saved? As we come to the end of that passage in Deuteronomy, how is it going to work? Well, as we've seen, when the fullness of the Gentiles comes, the church is going to be removed from this earth. The church, Jewish and Gentile believers together in Christ, will be removed from the earth. Following that will come the seven-year tribulation or the time of Jacob's trouble, as it is called in Jeremiah 30. And that gives us some insight into what re that the Lord will accomplish many things during the tribulation. But the focus of that period of time is God's dealing with his people, the nation of Israel. I heard somebody term it and it rhymed quite well. And it's, again, it doesn't cover everything, but I think it gets the focus right. That the tribulation is for the salvation of the Jewish nation. And it's a, a vague summary, but I think it's pretty right. The tribulation is for the salvation of the Jewish nation. It's the time of Jacob's trouble in Jeremiah 30 and verse 7. Speaking of, I mean, you look at it back, back in verse 6. Ask now and see if a male can give birth. Why do I see every man with his hands on his loins as a woman in childbirth? Jesus spoke of it at the time of, of birth pangs, didn't he? Matthew 24. And why have all faces turned pale? Verse 7, Alas, for that day is great, and there is none like it, and it is the time of Jacob's trouble, or Jacob's distress. But, he will be saved from it. Jesus in Matthew 24, spoke about this period as being the worst period in human history. Verse 21, Matthew 21, he says, For then, and this is, you know, following the abomination of desolation. Verse 21, For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever shall be. It hasn't happened yet. This is the time of Jacob's trouble. Now, a little bit further, Zechariah chapter 13, toward the end of the Old Testament. Zechariah 13. And again, speaking in the time of the tribulation, it says, 
And just for the sake of time, I'll just go straight into verse 8. And it will come about in all the land, declares the Lord, that two parts in it will be cut off, which means killed, and perish. But the third will be left in it. And I will bring the third part through the fire, refine them as silver is refined, and test them as gold is tested. They will call on my name, and I will answer them. I will say they are my people, and they will say, the Lord is my God. Two-thirds of the Jewish people will die in the tribulation. It's a doubling, pretty much, from the Holocaust. In the tragedy of the Holocaust, it was roughly one-third of the Jews were killed. About six million, I believe, the figure is. And as tragic and as horrific as that is, it will be two-thirds in the tribulation. I believe Ezekiel alludes to it in chapter 5, if you remember. He's told to cut off all his hair and shave it and divide it into three parts. And one third goes in the fire, one gets bashed with the sword, and the other third um, gets scattered. Again, as horrific as that, if you think of the numbers, I forget the figures of how many um, Jewish people there are believed to be in the world currently. But it's a lot. But on the flip side of it, we read earlier in chapter 11 that at the time of Elijah God said there's 7,000 which is a speck it's a, it's a speck for a whole nation but going off the figures of the, the millions and millions of Jews that are in the world today even a third of that we're talking millions and millions of Jews that will comprise national Israel at the end of the tribulation. And what does it say there toward the end of Zechariah? They will call out my name and I will answer them. Jesus said in Matthew 23, as he approaches Jerusalem and cries over Jerusalem, he wept and he said, you will not see my face again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. When they shout out what is from Psalm 118. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This is them calling out to him. And this is the time of when he will return, when he will return for Israel. And so in Zechariah 13 and verse 8, we saw that it will be a third that will be saved, but they will call out and he will come, he will return. And in Zechariah 14, we see something pretty amazing. I'm just going to read verses 1 to 5. It says, Behold, a day is coming for the Lord when the spoil will be taken from you and divided among you. For I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city will be captured, the houses plundered, the women ravished, and half of the city will be exiled, but the rest of the people will not be cut off from the city. Then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations. And when he fights on the day of battle, sorry, as when he fights on the day of battle. And in that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which is in front of Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives will be split in its middle from east to west by a very large valley so that half of the mountain will move toward the north and the other half will move toward the south and you will flee by the valley of my mountains for the valley of the mountains will reach to Azel yes you will flee as you fled before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah of Judah then the Lord my God will come and all the holy ones with him so we see when the Lord returns at his second coming. He is coming for Israel. He is coming to save Israel. His holy ones are coming with him. Now, it's interesting just to look back verse 3 and the beginning of verse 4. We know the one who returns to come and place his feet on the Mount of Olives is our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. If you remember when the disciples watched him ascend to heaven from the Mount of Olives... 
What did the angel say? Why are you looking up into the sky? In the same way that you saw him go up, it's the same way he's going to return. He's coming back there. But we see in verse 3, in the Hebrew, it is, Then Yahweh will go forth and fight against those nations as when he fights on the day of battle. And in that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. Our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ, is Yahweh, Jehovah, God himself. There's many, many places in the Bible that demonstrate this just from the text. God himself in the form of his son, he's going to come back and he's going to fight for Israel and he's going to save them physically as, as well as spiritually. And his holy ones will come with him. You know, this is, I've, I found this amazing. I was looking at this and when you look at it, this was the second prophecy ever recorded first prophecy really ever recorded was to do with Jesus' first coming. You know, by the seed of the woman, he shall bruise your head and you shall, he shall crush your head and you shall bruise his heel. I was speaking of the Lord's first coming when he accomplished his work on Calvary. The second prophecy, you don't see it as a prophecy until you go all the way to Jude and Jude 14. When Jude says, and e, e, um, Enoch prophesied the seventh generation from Adam, prophesied, prophesied about the Lord's second coming to bring judgment to all the nations and all his holy ones coming with him. Enoch, just seven generations from Adam. So we've got the first prophecy in the Bible about his first coming, second prophecy in the Bible about his second coming. And it's repeated here. It says in um, 1 Thessalonians 4 as well about his holy ones coming with him. And when you really look at those verses, you see that actually it's the angels and us coming back with him. What part will take place with this, whether we'll just be observers, I don't know. But we will see all this take place one day. And why people are not interested in this, I don't know. I don't know because it blows my mind to read these things. It really does. It's astounding. This is how it's going to play out. This is how all Israel will be saved. As we come on to verse 27, and this is, this is God's word, this is his promise, and this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. What covenant is he speaking about? The new covenant in Jeremiah 31. I did say we'd have a, a number of passages to read, but it's good stuff, this is God's word. Jeremiah 31, where it speaks about the new covenant. In verse 31, I hope you don't mind, I'm just, I'm just going to read through it. In Jeremiah 31, 31. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant, which they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and on their heart I will write it, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. We've just read about it. And they shall not teach again each man his neighbour and each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. This is why he's speaking about in Romans eleven twenty seven. This covenant, again, just to remind you, this was not made with the church. We are so privileged to be partakers of the blessings that have come from it. To be brought into th th these blessings, but this was made with Israel. And when does it happen? When look this what we've just read. When does it happen? It's future in Romans 11. The deliverer will come from Zion. This won't be fulfilled until the Lord returns and Israel recognize him as their Messiah, call out to him. And it's then when this covenant really comes to pass. It's been inaugurated by the death of the Lord on the, on the cross. We're the ones in receipt of the blessings of it now. 
but it won't be fully realized by Israel until the Lord returns and then he will take away their sins. It's very helpful again to remember that this is made with Israel because when we read about it in Ezekiel, I don't believe the word covenant is actually in the passage, but you, you know it's there in Ezekiel 36. Again, how often the church uses this and applies this directly to themselves. Ezekiel 36, 24. For I will take you from the nations, gather you from all the lands, and bring you into your own land. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a new heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. And you will be careful to observe my ordinances. And you will live in the land that I gave to your forefathers so that you will be my people and I will be your God. Speaking of the same thing. Now again, there are, there are truths and principles we can take from this. But primarily, we, we, we can't apply all of this. It's got the mention of the land in here. It's got the mention of God causing a people to work by his law, walk by his law. Speaking of the law that will be implemented in the millennial kingdom. We'll be in heaven in glory. Again, this is a verse that is used to go along with this lordship salvation error. That if you're a real believer, God will make you walk according to his law. But he's, he's not speaking about this. So again, we have to be careful. This is the covenant that God has, has made and it's unconditional. It's not dependent on anybody else other than God himself. In verse 28... It says from the standpoint of the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. And speaking of national Israel, but from the standpoint of God's choice or from the standpoint of election, literally in the Greek, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. So from the standpoint of the gospel, they are enemies. Who was it? Again, who was it that tried to prevent the gospel being spread to the Jews and to the Gentiles? It was Jews. Right from the beginning, even up until this day. Do you know how hard it is for the gospel message to be spread in Israel? Secular and religious leaders in Israel do everything within their power to stop the gospel going around that nation. It's them. They are against the gospel message. And have been for 2,000 years. But, from the standpoint of election or God's choice, they're beloved. We saw the election in the, um, earlier in the chapter, in verse 5. That was the, the, the spiritual election, if you like. The, the group who have believed in Jesus. The group within the election that are the, the spiritual election. This is speaking of the greater national chosen people of God. It's got to be, because the, the, the believers, the spiritual election, you can't call them enemies of the gospel, can you? National Israel is still God's chosen people. From the standpoint of God's choice, they're beloved. You can't get around that word. You look up that word in the Greek, it is agapetos, agapetos. What word does that make you think of? Agapai, God's agapai love. This is the adjective from that root word, the recipients, they are the recipients of the agape love. Why? Because they're anything special? Or a great nation? Or deserving somehow? No, the reason it is given here is for the sake of the fathers. God is faithful to the promises he made with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob regarding their physical descendants. You go back and read in Ezekiel, that God says, I'm doing all of this for you. Not because of you, but because of my holy name. 
which you profaned amongst the nations when I sent you out amongst the nations. You profaned my name, but I'm going to show the whole nations through you that I am a God of his word and I will accomplish it. I'm going to do it for my holy name. But also, like it says here, tied in with his holy name is his truth and his faithfulness, isn't it? And he's got to be faithful to the promises he made to the fathers. This is how vital this subject is. If we don't take this to God at his word, he's a liar. If he is done with the Jews, he's a liar. And what hope have we got to hold on to the promises given to us? It's all tied up with the holiness and the faithfulness of God himself. It's his name. He's attached his name. His, um, I'm trying to think of the word. His integrity to these promises that he's made. So we know we will see him come through. Because, verse 29, the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. How many things in this life are offered and then taken away? Even with the best intentions sometimes, because as weak and frail humans, we can't follow through on things that we have sometimes said we will do. It shouldn't be like that. We should be as good as our word. But the only person who can really be as good as his word is God himself. When he is declared he's going to do something, we take him on his word. And if again, this is so good for us because we've seen it happen. We've seen so much of his promises to Israel already come through to pass. The regathering of them to their land is absolutely miraculous. I started reading that book that you lent me. I tell you what, it's absolutely amazing. It's just miracle after miracle and circumstance after circumstance that the world would never have imagined. How are they going to come back from all over the world? They people didn't know about aeroplanes back then, did they? <laughs> from countries that you wouldn't even imagine. But we've been called. We've been given gifts. The greatest of them all, eternal life with our Heavenly Father. It's irrevocable. Irrevocable. We are eternally sons and daughters. And it should create some, not, not just assurance, but some excitement and joy in us when we see that God is rock solid on his word. He won't budge on anything that he has promised. We are held so tight in his hand that we will never be removed from it. This is our God. And it's absolutely amazing. For just as you once were disobedient to God... But now have been shown mercy because of their disobedience. We saw, didn't they? they were, the branches broken off because of their unbelief. We've been grafted in because of faith. We've been shown mercy. The Gentiles have been shown mercy. So these also now have been disobedient in order that because of mercy shown to you, they also may now be shown mercy. Again, Paul spoke about moving his, his, his fellow countrymen to jealousy, didn't he? The salvation has come to the Gentiles, and I magnify my ministry if I may also move some of them to jealousy. They should look at the blessings that are now in the, in the, in the Gentile realm and think, well, that, that, they were ours. They were ours. Look what's happened to us for the last 2,000 years. The wandering Jew. And the church will be um, demonstrating it more than anybody. But all, God, in verse 32, God has shut up all in disobedience. Why? That he might show mercy to all, Jew and Gentile alike. You go back to Romans 3.9. And he says, the question is asked, what then? Are we better than they? Not at all, for we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin. And individually it goes right back to the Garden of Eden, when sin, Grant was talking earlier about that, the, the lie and the sin and the death that came in. But in terms of nations... You go back to the period between the flood and the Tower of Babel, when the nations were established, they all shot up under sin. All of them. 
what happened at Babel? All the nations, all the people coming together to, to build that tower in defiance of what God had said to do. All the peoples, I should say, and God scattered the nations. All were shut up in sin. Rejecting the creator. Worshipping the creation instead of the creator. Being handed over to a futile mind because of these things. And what happened to Israel, like we you know, said earlier, hardened. Hardened because they rejected their father. They rejected the one who brought them out of Egypt. Hardened toward his word. Hardened toward the Messiah when he came. Didn't recognize the time of the visitation. But in God's great scheme, in God's plan, it wasn't a problem for him. Because God's desire is to show mercy to all. It's not God's desire that any shall perish. But for all to come to a knowledge of the truth. God wants to show mercy to all. And he's brought these things about in such a way that we, we, we can't truly fathom it. And this is what was making me think about some of these things earlier. We, we can't fathom all of this. We come on to the last part of this chapter. Verse 33. Where it says the depth and the riches of both wisdom and knowledge of God. And it is true, it is so true that it, you just take the gospel message for example. 1 Corinthians 15 and the, just those first three verses. Christ died on the cross to pay for our sins, was buried, was resurrected on the third day. And showed himself to all those people. A child can understand that and not only understand it but really believe it. So in that sense, there's a... There, there's a a shallowness to, to what we need to begin with but the depths of it like I'm sure you've heard said many times the, the, the greatest of minds the most spiritual of men could never plummet anywhere near to the greatest depths of it we will spend an eternity with God and we still aren't going to know it all and it's called as riches riches, this is treasure the knowledge and the wisdom of God shall be seen as treasure to us God's word is described as treasure, isn't it? To be desired more than gold and silver. How unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who became his counsellor? Now there's a sense that we can know so much, can't we? I mean, we've got to take the whole counsel of God. And if we go forward just a few pages into 1 Corinthians and chapter 2. We're nearly finished. Verse 11, 1 Corinthians 2, verse 11. For who among men has known the thoughts of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, the thoughts of God no one knows except the spirit of God. But what's happened to us when we believe? Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things freely given to us by God. Which things we also speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the Spirit, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. So because we have his Holy Spirit, because we have his revealed word to us, the full counsel of God, we can know, I mean, look at this, 60, it's not a small book, is it? 66 books. There's so much that is in here. And often it raises questions and brings to light the fact that, yeah, there's, there's almost an infinite amount of things that we don't. But we can know so much. We can know so much. And we can't use it in his excuse of verses like this. Oh, yeah, but God's depth, so we can't ever get to the bottom of it. But he still requires us to get to know him in the ways that he has revealed here in the word, doesn't he? But... When you compare it to who he, he really is in his fullness, which we will never see, really, you know. He is holy. He is above all. Unfathomable ways, unsearchable judgments. And who can become his counsellor? It's from Job, isn't it, you know, when he's having that discourse with Job. All right, then, Job, if you were there, you tell me what happened when I created all these things. Who is this that darkens my counsel? Who, 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 what are you going to tell God that he don't know? <laughs> or who am I going to... He says it's a funny thing to think, isn't it, when you really think about it. Or who was first given to him, that it might be paid back to him. And this is where it really starts to build. Now we see 
It's all about him. God is the all in all. And we are just the beneficiaries, just the recipients of his grace. Because we think we do things for God. Or, or give from our finances or our time or whatever it may be. But he's given it as all to begin with. <laughs> this is grace. I just jotted down 1 Corinthians 20, sorry, 1 Chronicles 29, verse 14. I always remember when I think about things like this, what um, King David said. 1 Chronicles 29, so when he's called for Israel, for the people to give the, uh, the, the materials, everything that is needed for his son Solomon to build the temple. And they gave so much gold, silver materials. There was so much they gave, but David sees the truth behind it. And he says in verse 11, this 1 Chronicles 29, verse 11, Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. Indeed, everything that is in the heavens and in the earth, thine is thy dominion, O Lord, and you, thou did exalt thyself as head over all. Both riches and honour come from thee, and thou dost rule over all, and in thy hand is power and might, and in Sorry, and it lies in thy hand to make great and strength, strengthen everyone. So he says, all riches and honour and glory come from thee. And then in verse 14 it says, but who am I and who are my people that we shall be able to offer as generously as this? For all things come from thee and from thy hand we have given thee. Verse 16 O Lord our God, all this abundance that we have provided to build thee a house for thy holy name, it is from thy hand, and all is thine. And as Paul moves on to say, verse 36, but from him, this is from him, what we just looked at, and through him, and to him, are all things to him, be the glory forever. Amen. Let's close in prayer.